this appearance that I'll read and then shift gears to talk about some game projects. The first part is called Character and Glyph. The majority of the common characters in the major languages of the world are encoded in the first 65,536 code points, states the Unicode Consortium. But the 16-bit encoding has the capability to encode up to 1,114,112 code points. Long gone are the quaint days of ASCII's 128 code points. Unicode even encodes fictional writing systems, such as Elvish or Klingon. There's some Klingon. <laughs> its code space includes any writing system whatsoever, without regard to whether it was ever employed by human culture. More than this, since streams of ASCII remain the basis of all file transfers on the net, and since ASCII is now a subset of Unicode, and since Unicode provides a structure for exchange and storage of data, then we must recognize that this encoding is the fundamental writing of all that is on the net. Joe Becker's 1988 draft proposal for Unicode states, quote, that a clear and all-important distinction is made between characters, which are abstract text content-bearing entities, and glyph, so there, there it is, and glyphs, which are visible graphic forms. This distinction continues in the standard implemented and maintained to this day. The Unicode 6.2 core specification released in 2011 states, characters are the abstract representations of the smallest components of written language that have semantic value. Okay, so what's meant by abstract there? It explains that characters refer to abstract meaning and or shape rather than specific shapes. To say the least, this distinction between abstract shape and specific shape is rather abstract. What do they mean by semantic here? According to their ex explanation, it's not that a given character is meaningful. The character A may or may not be meaningful. Rather, according to Corpella's Unicode explained, semantic, in this case, would rather be better to say that the character has a recognized identity, and it may sometimes be used as meaningful in itself. So this is about recognition, recognition of the, visual, of the visible character. So in this case, meaning and semantics are part of a recognizable identity of the character within the system of Unicode. The Unicode standard technical introduction states, the character identified by a Unicode code point is an abstract entity, such as the Latin character capital A, or a Bengali digit 5. The mark made on the screen or paper, called a glyph, is a visual representation of the character. So, okay, what is a glyph, I ask? A glyph is perceived. It's phenomenally given in the world of appearances. It, and this is the quote again from Joe Becker, represents the shapes that characters have when they are rendered or displayed, end of quote. It's technically produced. In contrast to characters, this is the quote again, glyphs appear on the screen or paper as particular representations of one or more characters. So glyphs and characters are part of a single writing technology. One side abstract, encoded, conceptual. On the other side, material perceived and undefined but vanishing. Glyphs outnumber characters. There are multiple but finite possible renderings for any character. So a character could be many sizes, many resolutions, many forms of visibility, any of which can be recognized as characters, fonts, bold, what have you. But glyphs are recognized for the encoding rendered, but they're fundamentally unnumbered. So in other words, glyphs are constantly appearing but in some ways we, we can say nothing about glyphs. What we talk about are the characters. Glyphs appear and are seen but are not defined by Unicode. Appearances are disordered and without accounting. To save, to record, to archive is to recognize the character, not the glyph, which is always gone. The difference is between wild phenomena in a waste field on the one hand and specific forms or characters on the other. The character on the screen, the text that I see and I read, is no character, only encoding read through appearances. What I see but not what I read is innumerable disorderings of appearances. Characters are logistic, weaponized constructions of reading and seeing through systematic di technical distributions of the visual and the symbolic. Marvel with me at the wonder of glyphs, the, the blind sloughing away of the matter of glyphs. They appear, they vanish, the flowing and fleeing energetics of the screen are mobilized and lost by the biotechnics that insist on the character glyph distinction and then hold fast to character encoding into ASCII and now Unicode. So the history of the character and the glyph are similar to each other. The earliest English usages of both refer to carving, cutting, marking. In the 17th century, character came to refer to the mental and moral qualities of an individual while glyph continued to refer to the material and physical engraving. So I tell you, it's not just a letter, but also any appearance on the screen is a glyph etched or inscribed on that surface. Every screen is a glyph, always being screen, screen refresh, refresh, 
Reflash is good. Screen, <laughs> screen reflash is about 20 flickers per second, or about 1,040 images a minute, or about 86,400 images an hour, or more than a million a day, a quarter of a billion a year on any one screen, bursting and flowing away and gone. And that's just one screen. Our machines are dedicated to this tremendous and ecstatic expenditure of images. Digital phenomena is passing, disappearing as Maya. But the goal is not to categorize categorically these phenomena and opposed to other phenomena that appear and are, are archivable and enclosable, but rather to see digital technology as producers of passing phenomena, as emitters of ephemera. The kind of interiority we share with the digital is as much this flickering as it is presence and enclosure. Quite concretely and materially, we, materially we have to share in our interior, in our memory and experience, those things archived in the digital. We have to share in those interior in, in the interior for them to be archived for us. The fabulous Wayback Machine, offering 456 billion web pages saved over time, that was the number yesterday, takes snapshots of the web, a process that in its very plenitude reminds us of failure, loss, missing pages, pages filmed with spam. Life streaming proposes to record every moment. The German media activist Christian Heller argues the battle for bourgeois pleasures of privacy is over and lost in the post-privacy era of open exchange, and he enacts this on a wiki documenting everything from his daily routines to personal finances. Fullness, but also passing. I think of the See You, See Me video conferencing client, developed in 1992 and very popular in the 90s. It was a parallel in the early mosaic-driven web. It suggested an alternative history of today's digital media. Not so much the, the web page, but a web of continuous, real-time, face-to-face experience. Not pages and objects, but a web of encounters rather than documents. IRC channels and even the chat rooms of today, sites of tight, intense encounter. And indeed, they can still be so. And I think of this in the game spaces of today. The imaginary web that I'm describing both never took place after about 2000 when CUCME disappeared, and is always taking place on the web today for the win. The speed record for Half-Life, a game that took me months of late nights to complete, was set on April 14, 2014 at 20 minutes and 41 seconds. The run was broken into over 317 perfectible and repeatable segments and tackled by the runners Quadrazid, Crashport, Cool Kid, Pineapple, Yalter, Spider Waffle, and Philip. They report the run took four years of analyzing, theory crafting, and execution, plus a specially made heads-up display or HUD. So speedrunners complete games in the fastest possible time. They record the run, and they distribute the recordings on, online. Well, what sort of record is the recording? Well, what's the point of the recording? Firstly, proof of the run, of setting the record, to let all the other challengers see it. Secondly, the runs are fun to watch. There's an exhilarating video in, on YouTube chronicling the record-setting half-life run. This is an image of it here. Players zipping through the levels, taking advantage of every possible strategy and cheat. Gordon Freeman there soaring through Black Mesa. Third, of course, the runs are out there for study and improvement, with the goal of setting an even faster record. The run is devoted to the record. The record may always be outrun. There's always another run. The speedrunner is a sequence breaker, playing the game out of intended order, violating any purported narrativity. The proper game, the game that's played, all this is consumed and spat out in the speedrun. The speedrun is a glitch exploiter. Exploit the 16-star run in Mario, the flying glitch in Half-Life 2, Kagnarak's hammer and Morrowind. In all of these, you rapidly move past the story that engages the noobs. You race for the win. Originally aligned with the demo scene, speedrunning is now a vast community with its own lingos, shared video, tips, accounts of the exploit. The speedrun is a memory of the game. It's an abstract. It's an extraction. At the same time, it's a precise, comprehensive, and analytical knowledge of the game, of its physics, its spaces, its content, its actors, and so on. The speedrun eats the game, incorporates it into itself. The speed is less than the walkthrough. The walkthrough provides detailed step-by-step -step instructions on completing and traversing the challenges of game puzzles and bosses. It provides precise drop rates, respawn locations, boss weaknesses, etc. Like the abstract or precy, or even the cliff notes, or I think in Canada you call them Cole's notes, the walkthrough implies a fidelity to the game. Da databases cover every possible quest rock through of Skyrim or World of Warcraft. The IGN website contains over 45,000 entries for game walkthroughs. The walkthrough represents the game, it writes the game. Now, Machinima also record gameplay, in this case, in explicitly cinematic mode. 
No, matter, no longer the infidelity of the walkthrough machinima as a consumption of the game as raw material for new fan-created artifacts. Walkthroughs, machinima, speedruns, these paratechs participate in a process of consuming but also writing the game. Scholarly attention to the walkthrough emphasizes its relation to playing the game. In this view, the walkthrough is a derivative of the primary experience of play. It's a commentary on the game. So I'm thinking here of, of accounts by people like Espen Arseth or Joe Walker Redberg, where the walkthrough is both a fan-produced artifact but also interferes with the experience of the game. So in this case, reading the walkthrough and following it in playing is precisely not to play the game. The speed is less, but like the speed run, the walkthrough consumes the game and converts it to speed. Walkthroughs also emphasize the cheat, the strategy, the exploit. Google for how not to be an idiot in Battlefield. You'll find no end of precise walkthrough cheats and strategies. My Cheats, wonderful website, is built as a 1UP Network's premier video games cheats and strategy website. And IGN now owns this, so it's the biggest official cheat site out there. Great site for walkthroughs. America at Play at the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York, uses a 5,000 square foot play space to record the public playing on thousands of video games in the museum's collection. Archival recording is also the goal of the traversal developed in the NEH-funded Pathfinders project by Dini Grigar and Stuart Moulthrop. Traversals are, quote, documentary video recordings of readers as they engage in the works of early computational literature involving multipath reading strategies dating from the crucial periods of invention that preceded the popularization of the net. They insist on the traversal. They insist that traversals do not preserve the work. Traversals are speed runs through the work. Everything is for the win. This record is not for the recording, but for the gamer, but also for the writer. Okay, so I sped through that, and that's like 10 minutes, right? Do I have 10 minutes left? Uh, you have eight minutes, but eight I, minutes. Will, I okay. will be kind. So <laughs> the last part, I, so speedruns, um, ASCII, I don't play games is the last part. Here I'm talking about some game projects I'm engaged in that also are ephemeral spam performances in game spaces. Spam performances, their experiences spam. We're typically kicked out of the game spaces as spammers. Um, they, they, again, they engage with what I see as the ephemeral and the vanishing. Coal Dust is the older of these projects. It involves agitprop street theater within the game Lord of the Rings Online. The performances are based on resource exploitation. I come from a part of the United States that's dominated by the coal mining industry and by resource exploitation in general by mining. So we put on performances about this. Uh, the most recent one was done about the Battle of Blair Mountain, which, if you know about it, is the largest armed uprising in U.S. history um, and also the largest armed conflict in, in the United States after the Civil War uh, took place in West Virginia. Um, so these are, I'm not going to go through the manifesto, but part of this is to set up a series of impossible juxtapositions of energy consumption in games and energy consumption in the real, um, the activity spent playing games, uh, activity spent in the real, and of course, you know, th there's all sorts of uh, ways of numbering these things, Interactiv internet activity using roughly as much energy each day as the airline industry, nearly half of this generated by coal, Facebook, you know, we come up with statistics about Facebook activity and so on. Why do we do it in Lord of the Rings, right? Because everybody knows Lord of the Rings, they've read the books, they've seen the movies, it's got a concrete imaginary space for us, it's a space where um, the only people who work are the evil people, um, everybody else sits around in the shower and smokes weed and so on. Um, <laughs> so we had a series of references here, of course, virtual memorials. Um, you know, this is the, the Second Life Memorial to uh, September 11th, uh, Tiananmen Square. Uh, that's the Second Life Memorial to the Vietnam Memorial. Um, we had inspiration in terms of emergent gaming, which I already talked some about speed running. This is jumping uh, as well. It's a, so an emergent practice of going to games. Uh, we had inspiration from in-game performances such as Quake Friends. This is Joseph DeLapp's classic performances of going into the game Quake Arena and acting out episodes of the, of the series Friends. Right, they're wonderful to see, <laughs> Ross and Rachel and so on. We had inspiration, uh, and, and as I'll say in a sec, we were also inspired by sort of agitprop, guerrilla, street theater um, from Bresh through the 60s and so on. Lord of the Rings Online is a pastoral space, as you might imagine. Um, full of energy, uh, full of labor, right, in order to compete in these spaces, in order to get really awesome weapons, you need to do some sort of job, such as farm, or in most cases, mine, right, and in fact, you can mine for coal in Lord of the Rings Online. We also thought of Chinese gold farming, but that's entirely, we could go into that in the Q&A if we want. This is about virtual coal here. So we would go into these spaces, and we would act out 
um, performances. We call them vigils. Certainly the most recent version of it, we call them vigils, which we, of course, in English means the lack of work. A vigil is something you do in mourning. We were mourning this event that was uh, uh, both the labor not represented in the virtual world, the Battle of Blair Mountain, which is disappearing from real space. Uh, this, as I said, it's the largest armed uprising in U.S. history, but the mountain and the area where it took place on uh, continue to be owned by the mining companies who continue to mine it, and this, the place where the battle took occurred has pretty much been strip mined away. Um, so we, uh, a vigil also meant, uh, meant we went in and we lit fires in the, in the game and continued to keep these fires going while we acted out our plays. And then, like I said, in the vast majority of cases, we would be kicked out as spammers, or um, people would attack us sometimes, um, which is, again, part of the kind of conceptual project here. Um, so then, uh, vanishing traces, there, there's what it looks like now. It used to be a mountain. Um, okay, so then I'm going to just finish by the most recent one, which is Beckett Spam's Counter-Strike. This is performing Beckett's Endgame and Counter-Strike Global Offensive. So, <laughs> Counter-Strike Global Offensive is, by some accounts, the most popular game in the world. At any moment of the day, right, right now, there's about half a million people playing Global Offensive, which makes it a, a large population. Um, over time, it's been this enormously popular game. It's also fan-produced, you know, originally <coughs> made it uh, being produced by fans. Um, it, it interested me because, unlike Lord of the Rings Online, which is a vast, open, multiplayer sp space, this is multiplayer, with, but with small tactical groups with a very specific task of killing each other, killing each other over and over again. And for me, this was very Beckett-like. I mean, I thought of uh, that sense in Endgame, uh, here's Clove. What is, the, what is all this in a word? Is that what you want to know? Just a moment. And Clove looks out the window and the world is corpsed, right? You see, and, and, you know, Endgame, if you remember, is either taking place in a, in a lower middle class apartment in Dublin, um, you know, after, this, after the Second World War, or it's in the post-apocalypse, and it's, it's probably both at once, right? So we go in, we act these out. Um, in, unlike the Lord of the Rings one, we don't engage with people, we just do it. Again, we're typically killed or kicked out of the game. <laughs> Um, and uh, there, there's the image. So, like I said, I'm going fast, and that's how I think. So, thank you very much. <laughs>